Welcome, or welcome back. I'm Cassie, and this is A Wicked World. The story I have for you today was another one that was recommended by one of you, and it actually took place pretty close to me in Connecticut, but I had never heard of it until I started doing some research. It's a story about an innocent baby girl who was horrifically murdered just weeks before her first birthday. This is the story of Camilla Francisquini. Camilla Francesquini was born on December 3rd, 2021 in Nagatuck, Connecticut. Her mother's name is Crystal Neves and her father's name is Christopher Francesquini. Little Camilla was adored by her family and was a happy, smiley baby who rarely fussed. She also loved watching Coco Melon and Mickey Mouse Clubhouse. Camilla and her parents had been living with Christopher's father, Ramon, and Ramon's wife and Ramon's daughter, Jasmine. Now the couple, along with Camilla, had been living in the basement of the home since December of 2020 when Chris had been released from prison. Chris had been in prison for pistol whipping somebody close to death and had been sentenced in 2012 to 10 years behind bars, along with an additional 10 years of special parole for first degree assault. But it was not long after his release that Christopher was back in jail again, the following November of 2021. This time, though, it was for an alleged carjacking in West Haven, Connecticut. He had been arrested just hours after, and while in police custody, Christopher fought with police officers, and he tried to escape their custody. He had actually stolen a pepper spray from one of the officers and began to spray it at them. So that gained him some additional charges. Keep in mind, this was only weeks prior to Camila's birth. Probably not how a new dad should be acting. Christopher would not be released until June of 2022 on special parole with a $375,000 bond. He was then fitted with a GPS ankle monitor. And Christopher also had other arrests on his record as well. Possession of narcotics, risk of injury to a child, and assault and battery. Now, in addition to having a long criminal history, Camila's father, Christopher, also suffered from multiple mental illnesses, including bipolar disorder. And Christopher had actually been put on medication for this, but his family said that they did not believe he was taking his medications. One of the reasons they believed this was because Christopher had told Camila's mother, Crystal, that he heard voices, voices that were telling him to kill his father, but he said he would never do that. He would never harm anyone. Which is odd because it seems like he tried to kill somebody back in 2012 by almost pistol whipping them to death. Chris could also be very paranoid and he thought that somebody was out to get him. So since Christopher was incarcerated when Camilla was born, he didn't get to spend the first few months of her life with her. However, when he was released, Crystal said that Christopher was a great dad. He adored his daughter and always wanted to be around her. Christopher would also frequently post social media pictures of him and Camila together. With Christopher on house arrest, he grew increasingly impatient and irritable. He was upset that he couldn't leave the house to look for a job. And on top of that, he and Crystal had been arguing more and more and had recently been talking about ending their relationship. On the night of November 17th, 2022, Christopher would ignore his father, Ramon. Ramon had just finished feeding Camila, and Christopher had not come up yet to get his daughter to put her to bed for the night. And Ramon asked Christopher if Camila was going to be sleeping in the basement with them or up in his room in her crib. Since Christopher didn't answer his father when he asked him this, Ramon assumed that Camila would be sleeping upstairs in his room. So he went to his bedroom to put her down for the night. Ramon thought this was kind of weird, since the little girl's parents were normally her primary caregivers. But on this night, Christopher seemed like he wanted nothing to do with his daughter. Then the following morning, on November 18th, 2022, Ramon would wake up early around 4.30 to drive Crystal to her job at Dunkin' Donuts. After Ramon had dropped off Crystal at work, he went back home to take a nap. At this time, he said that he did not know if Camila was still in her crib. He had just assumed that she was, because the little girl would normally sleep until 11 a.m. And the playpen that she was sleeping in had a blanket over the top of it, so that she wouldn't get cold from the fan that was in the room. When Ramon woke up from his nap around 10 a.m., he noticed that there was a missed call from Crystal on his phone. And when he called her back, she asked him for a ride home from work. He agreed. 
But prior to him heading out of the house to pick up Crystal, Ramon heard his son, Christopher, in the basement. So he went downstairs to talk to him. When he did, Christopher told his father, I'm mad at you. I hate you. Ramon asked him why, as he hadn't done anything. But Christopher just laughed and walked away. Brushing it off, Ramon left the house to go get Crystal. When they got back home, Crystal was tired from working such an early shift at work, and she decided that she wanted to take a nap. However, before she made it down into their basement bedroom, Christopher stopped her. He insisted that she did not need to lay down. Instead, they needed to go shopping for Thanksgiving food. Crystal told him fine, she would go, but she needed to change her clothes quickly first. However, Christopher did not want her to do that either and told her not to go in the room. He said it was too messy, but he was going to clean it when they got back home later. Crystal saw a quilt on the floor and just wanted to move that out of the way. But Christopher objected, saying, I gotta go before probation tells me no. I don't think he's supposed to be out of the house anyways. I don't think probation ever told him yes. So Crystal and Christopher left for the store after this, borrowing Ramon's Chevy Impala. The couple then headed to Waterbury. On the way there, Crystal said that she saw Christopher texting somebody, though she didn't know who it was. But he had texted them in regards to a mental health treatment facility called CMHA. So Christopher and Crystal were supposed to be headed to Walmart to buy their Thanksgiving food. But on the way there, Christopher had changed the plans. He needed his medicine, as he put it. So they were now going to be meeting up with somebody in the PetSmart parking lot. On their way to the store, many roads had been closed off and Christopher had gotten angry at Crystal for it. His frustration would build until they got to PetSmart and a car pulled up next to them with a male driver in it. Presumably who Christopher was meeting. And right then, Christopher would also ask Crystal if he could have her cell phone. She gave it to him, and then he asked her a strange question. He asked Crystal if she would do absolutely anything for him, even if that meant putting on a collar and a leash and being led around by him. To which she obviously said no, and she asked for her phone back. But Christopher would not return it. Crystal asked him several more times. Then Christopher said to her, since you want your phone so much, and he took his phone and her phone and smashed them into the ground. Crystal, who was scared and upset by the way Christopher was acting, decided to walk into PetSmart at that time to borrow a phone to call for another ride back home. Police would later find the two phones smashed in the parking lot, alongside a credit card with Christopher's name on it and his cut-off GPS ankle monitor. After she was able to make a phone call, Crystal returned back outside to wait for her ride, and at that time, she noticed that Christopher and the Impala were gone. Upon returning back from the pet store, Crystal went down to their room to clean up. And as Crystal entered the bedroom, she noticed that there was something red on the floor next to the quilt that she had seen earlier, and she figured that Christopher must have spilled something. So Crystal lifted up the quilt, and underneath, there was red everywhere along with the lifeless body of her baby girl, Camila. Crystal started screaming, the baby, the baby. Her family members rushed downstairs to see that the little girl had been stabbed as well as dismembered. Christopher's sister, who also lived in the home, would call 911. And Ramon would call his wife, who was at work, and he would tell her to come home because Chris killed the baby, he said. And when the first responders arrived, the paramedics checked Camila for signs of life, but the little girl was pronounced dead at 11.46 a.m. on November 18th, 2022. An autopsy of Camila's body was performed, and it was found that she had marks consistent with strangulation as well. Her cause of death was determined to be neck compressions with sharp force injuries. Her death was ruled a homicide. Upon searching the home, investigators would find several pieces of clothing in the basement bedroom where Camila had been found, and they would take these in as evidence. There were two gray Nike sneakers with blood splotches that were found on the other side of the room, away from where little Camila had been found. Family members later told the police that the shoes were indeed Christopher's. Detectives also found a t-shirt and a gray child's sock with blood on it, a towel, suspected marijuana joints, and a smoking device. Police determined that Christopher Francis Guini was their prime suspect and they placed a warrant out for his arrest. 
He was charged with murder and risk of injury to a child. A press conference was held on the day of Camila's murder in order to alert the public of the crime as well as alert them that their main suspect was Christopher and he was on the run. He was also likely driving the Impala. The FBI would also become involved with finding Christopher and they would offer a $10,000 reward. And after days of searching for him, with no results, this reward would then be upped to $25,000. The search efforts for him were huge, and there were even billboards placed along interstates 84, 91, and 95, with a picture of Christopher, information about him, as well as the reward money for his capture. Police would speak with all of the members of Camila's family. The last time anyone had seen Camila alive was when Christopher's stepmother, the one whose room she had slept in the night before, had kissed the little girl on the head before she had gone to work. Now this was around 7.15 in the morning. Police also wanted to know why Ramon had almost immediately after finding Camilla's body, told his wife that it was Chris who had done it. Ramon said it was because Christopher was the only one in the house at the time. Then he remembered that his daughter's boyfriend, Angel, was actually in the house as well. But Ramon was not concerned that Angel was involved in any way. Because he only ever left his room to take medication and eat. He was also known to be very calm and non-confrontational. Ramon also said that Angel had no idea what had happened to Camila at the time of the interview. However, police also wanted to speak with Angel. Angel said he had gotten up that morning, gone downstairs to make himself some eggs and take his medication, and then he had returned back up to his room. He said he later heard screaming and then saw police cars outside the window in his room, but he didn't go outside because he didn't know what was going on and he didn't want to get involved. When Camila's mother, Crystal, spoke with police, she told them that when she had gotten in the car with Christopher earlier that day to go to Waterbury, she had noticed that he was profusely sweating. And when she asked him why, he just said it was because of the heat being on so high in the car. She also said she did not notice any blood on him at the time. Crystal was so confused though. Christopher had never showed any signs that he would ever hurt his baby girl. And he had never told Crystal that he had had any voices in his head telling him to hurt their daughter. Christopher's sister, Jasmine, who lived in the house, spoke with police as well. And she told them that she was in and out of sleep from about 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. After that, she would get up and get ready for work. Jasmine told the police that she may have heard a faint cry in the morning, but she was unsure. She also said she had seen the Impala leaving the driveway earlier and had gone downstairs to have a word with her father, Raymond, about why Christopher was leaving the house when he was supposed to be on house arrest. Soon, the police would begin to receive reports of interactions between members of the public and Christopher. And one of these reports led police to find the gray 2006 Chevy Impala that Christopher had been driving. The car was found on the same day that Camila was murdered. It was found abandoned with an empty gas tank on the side of Interstate 91 South in New Haven. The person who had called in this tip told the police that he had helped Christopher, who had been parked on the side of the highway while the man was on his way to get his son. The man told police that he had driven Christopher to multiple gas stations looking for a gas can. He also let Christopher use his cell phone. After a little while, he told Christopher he needed to go. He had to go pick up his son, and he wouldn't be able to help him any further. He did, however, leave him with a few dollars and directions to New Haven. Upon locating the Impala, police recovered 13 pieces of evidence, including a black folding knife, which they would later find out, was indeed the murder weapon, and they found splotches of blood on the driver's seat as well as a few other places in the car. There were reported sightings of Christopher on Quinnipiac Street in New Haven later that same weekend. Then yet another person called into police and reported that they believed they had interacted with Christopher. Christopher had run out of gas again and he had no money, so he wanted to know where the nearest bus or train station was. This caller also reported that Christopher had altered his appearance but was still recognizable. Police would finally end up taking Christopher into custody two weeks after Camila's murder. Another citizen had called in and told police that they had seen Christopher 
at a bus stop on December 2nd, Christopher was then surrounded by officers with their guns drawn and placed under arrest. I have a little bit of the body cam footage here that I'll play for you. Get on the ground. On the ground. Get on the ground. On the ground. Christopher was then charged with murder under special circumstances. He was also charged with risk of injury to a child, second degree breach of peace, and second degree criminal mischief. He was held on a $5 million bond. During the two weeks that Christopher had been on the run, he also had missed two court dates in Bridgeport and Milford, which led him to racking up failure to appear charges on pending cases. When Christopher went before Waterbury Superior Court, he waived his right to a probable cause hearing and entered not guilty pleas on his charges. The total of his bond amount was also increased at that time to $7 million. The judge would also issue protective orders barring Christopher from communicating with three unnamed people, though my guess is that it's Crystal, his father, and his stepmother or his sister. At the time of this hearing, Christopher's attorney also asked the judge to place his client on a self-harm watch. And luckily, Christopher, who is still being held, will not be released from jail even if he was somehow miraculously able to come up with the money for his $7 million bond. Due to his parole being revoked on other cases, he had been out on bond for prior to his daughter's death. At most of his hearings since his arrest, Christopher has also refused to speak out loud to the judge or anybody else. This hearing happened very quickly. His attorney requested a probable cause hearing, and right when Francis Queenie was being escorted out the courtroom, we heard a very strong reaction from his father. Girl says, you're not going to say nothing? Great, you're not going to say nothing? You're not going to say nothing? The father of Christopher, Francis Queenie, having a major outburst in the courtroom as Francis Queenie remained silent during the brief hearing. So police would soon find out that on the day of Camilla's murder, after Christopher had left the parking lot of PetSmart, he had allegedly changed his clothes at an apartment in Waterbury before he headed to New Haven. Christopher had gone to this apartment looking for someone he knew who resided there, but they had not been home at the time. Christopher, however, knew some of the other people who were at the apartment at the time, and they allowed him inside. Several people would tell police that they knew Christopher's brother, but they hadn't seen Christopher or talked to him in years prior to that day. They also noticed that he had been extremely sweaty, and he had asked a few of them if they wanted to buy his dad's car from him. Another person at the apartment said that Christopher had used his phone to make fake Facebook and Snapchat accounts. This person also told police that Christopher had asked for a sweatshirt and someone had given him a white sweatshirt with a black and white checkered pattern on it. The one he was seen wearing in the security camera footage. And ironically, four days before the homicide, Christopher had actually received a favorable report from his probation officers who oversee pretrial defendants released on bond. And Christopher had been allowed to be removed from his court-ordered house arrest on Thanksgiving as well as Christmas Day. Christopher's trial date for Camila's murder has yet to be scheduled, but he is currently being held at the Garner Correctional Institution, where inmates with serious mental health disorders are placed. Little Camila had died just weeks prior to her first birthday, but her family and the community would celebrate her on that day anyways. They came together in the center of Nagatuck to hold a candlelight vigil. The Nagatuck police asked the community to wear pink or display pink lights on Camila's birthday, December 3rd. 
The Nugatuck police also wore their pink hashtag justice for Camila bracelets in show of support for Camila's loved ones. And Camila's mother, Crystal, spoke to the crowd thanking them for their support since the murder and saying that the best birthday gift for her baby is justice. On the six month anniversary of Camila's death, there was also a private memorial service. Members of the Nagatuck police attended as well, many of them who had severely been affected by Camila's death. The memorial service included a tree planting ceremony. The tree was a dogwood donated by the Waterbury Home Depot. Lilac lettering was painted on a nearby stone reading, your memory will forever bloom. Well, thank you for listening to all of Camila's story today. Camila's murder was one that nobody had seen coming, but people who are as violent as Christopher was known to get can be completely unpredictable. This man was just dangerous to be around from the sounds of it. A ticking time bomb. Sweet little Camila didn't stand a chance. So if you do like true crime and you want to hear it from me, then don't forget to hit that subscribe button below and turn on your notifications too so you'll know when I upload a new video, which is two to three times every week. Thanks for watching A Wicked World today. Until next time, take care guys. Bye. Thank you for being patrons of A Wicked World. Adina, Ali, Amanda, Amy, Angela, Angie, Brandy, Carrie, Catherine, Cecilia, Danielle D, Danielle H, Drew, Eric, Frank, Hannah Rama, Hannah, Kara, Lori, Linda, Marion, Mary, Mel, MJ Kelly, Neoma, Power 31312, Ray, Shayna, Stephanie, Susan, Suzanne, Tammy B, and Tammy S. You guys rock. Now, there's even more of a wicked world on Patreon. You'll have access to exclusive videos each month and more. Any support truly helps to make sure the victims never get forgotten and to highlight the shortcomings of society associated with each case. So check it out at patreon.com slash a wicked world or use the Patreon app. Do you have a suggestion for a case you'd like to see me cover? If so, send me an email at awickedworldtruecrime at gmail.com.